On this episode of Law Weekly, we discuss some of the recommendations from the National Assembly's Joint Special Ad Hoc Committee on the review of the 1999 Constitution. We have the views of a senior advocate of Nigeria, Olusegun Fabumi. Also showing on the program, Attorneys General of the Southwest States hold quarterly meeting, agree on framework for legal integration in their states. The Chief Judge of Lagos releases 33 prisoners from three correctional facilities in the states. And the Nigerian Bar Association inaugurates its Lawyers with Disabilities Forum. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Shola Shieli. The Deputy Senate President Uvie Omoagege, who chaired the Special Ad Hoc Committee on the Review of the 1999 Constitution, has laid its Constitution Amendment report before the lawmakers. There are 68 items for amendment in the Constitution. And in our conversation with Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Olusha Fabumi, we look a little closer at some of the recommendations. I began by getting his views on one of the recommendations which has generated a lot of controversy the one seeking to grant life pension to their presiding officers. If you look at the outcry about what is happening at the National Assembly, uh, I would have felt that the children have even gone to that area at all. Um, firstly, people believe that they are any more than what they are doing. The services they are rendering to the generation of the people is not commensurate with what they are earning. That is the opinion of the people. Although on their own side, they believe that uh, they are doing a lot of work and that what they are earning is not even enough for them. And then you also see the issue of constituency projects, you know, which runs into billions of Naira. So if you take all those together and now coming up to say, after you have left the National Assembly, you also have pension. But think of it, I mean, you were elected by the people to serve for a period of time. So I don't think the issue of pension should come in at all. The House of Reps Special Ad Hoc Committee has also recommended immunity for presiding officers of the National Assembly and judicial officers. Now, don't you think that this can cause a conflict of interest, especially for the judicial officers? Or what are your thoughts about this one? People for both, none is necessary. Uh, if you look at the, what, what are the legislators doing that require them not to be probed after they've concluded their terms in office, they should, be, they should allow people to you know, take cause actions against them. If they have nothing to be afraid of, you don't have any skeleton in your cupboard, why should you have immunity? The reason for immunity of the governor, the, let me start from the president, vice president, governor, and the deputy governor, is clearly stated. It's not to disturb them from carrying out their duties while they are in office. Because if there are too many cases or actions against them, they will not concentrate. They will spend all, they will spend all their time you know, defending, uh, court, defending court, cases. court cases and actions. And then you now have to attend to those court cases personally. You have to appear in court personally. And that was the reason. So if you are as a legislator elected by the people and then you have left office and you are now saying that people should not see actions again or while even you are there. Without a court order. Without, without a court condition. order. No. It's no, necessary. it's not necessary. If you have no skeleton in your cupboard, let people be free to institute and take action against you. And even for judges, I mean, I'm sorry to say it's my area, it's my constituency. But you, if you don't do anything that will necessitate anybody, if you have that, that can, you know, so many things about corruption that people are talking about, crying about in Nigeria today. And you now have court order before uh, judges or people, or people in the House of Assembly or Legislative can be prosecuted. No, it's, it's taking it higher than what is expected. People will cry more about corruption because it means that you cannot take action against anybody. And then, like you have pointed out, although there are some people who have not soiled their hands, who have integrity, have reputation, good character, they will do it the way it comes to them. But how many? And then, if you know that that uh, order is going to be against you, will you grant it? We are all human beings. 
So it is better for us to leave it as it were today. Now let's look at some other recommendations. There's the one seeking to create permanent legislative seats for women in the National Assembly and the State Houses of Assembly. I think what we should dare at is bringing in more women into politics. If you look at what is I, happening, I think this is, that is what no, this no, to you cannot make, you cannot make, you cannot create a provision in the constitution making some things permanent for some people, Why whatever not? the gender. Why not? No, you cannot. You cannot. It's going to create a problem even now and future. What I'm saying this is, look, what is good for the Greeks is also good for the Ganda. You, you are talking of women today. When women start, look, in the judiciary today, majority of the people who are judges are women. In the magistracy, they are women. And some other offices. So, if you are talking of legislature or politics, there will be a time that women will be, maybe at number men, when people know the fact that, look, you can trust women more. Why people appoint more women for judicial positions is because they believe that they are more trusted and have good character, and, although not 100%, but at least a woman will fear to say, look, come and bribe me. That is the belief. And maybe it's true. But if in future, you now say you make a permanent seat for women, and then the time comes when there are several women more than men. Oh, come on. Well, what does it matter? For? This is no. like a long time we've had more men than women. No, it matters. It's because women, what I believe strongly, seriously speaking, is that we should allow and encourage orientation. Look all over the world. You have women who are president, prime ministers. I'm sure Nigeria is going to get to that stage. But we shouldn't create permanent seat. No, it even Not looks no, it even looks odd somehow mm. that for a gender you make the seat permanent and for the other gender you say no. I mean for even me as a man, it's unconstitutional. So that's discrimination <laughs> right there. Yes. Now coming to your constituency, a lot of people have called for the separation of the office of the Attorney General of the Federation from the Minister of Justice and even at the state level. What are your thoughts on that one? Because we've been down this road several times. Do you think that the time is finally ripe for this separation? Well, it is. But the people involved, I'm not sure they are ready for it. How do you mean? Yes. You know, if it's separated, you are giving another part of the office to another person. You wield a lot of power and influence and it's political. And most of the people that are appointed, majority, are also politicians. You must be involved one way or the other for you to be appointed. But seriously speaking, the, those two offices should be separated, especially in our own climb, with what we are seeing. Uh, for example, I mean, you are aware of the case of uh, former Attorney General, Dorin Musayar Anduaka, Michael, uh, Michael Anduaka, in which the, his behavior was repugnant to the position he held as the Attorney General of the Federation. And the reason being that he was alluding more to the political side than professionalism. If you are taught well about his profession, that even though I was appointed by the politicians, I should think more of professionalism. He should have behaved the way he behaved. Because he even lost his rank. He lost, he lost his rank. He lost even, he's even been bad from, from holding public office for life. Yes. So how can you put your life at stake for a period just to do, just the, to do yeah, the bidding of politicians? So, so I believe strongly that if that the two offices are separated, you can face your profession squarely. But what about the person who has to do the political side of it? Will still, still not be the outcome? Well, you see, the, you see the, the point is just the reputation, character, and integrity of the person involved. involved. And that's why so many people don't want to join politics. Look, let me give you a very straightforward example. I, I started my practice from Afia Balola in 89, where I served. And I was aware that it was offered almost, at least I know of two appointments to be Attorney General of the Federation. He refused. It's because of this kind of situation, because once you accept that office and position, 
it's most time difficult for you not to do the bidding of the person that appointed is who pays the pipe uh, who, who pays the piper dictates the tune so and most times as human beings especially when you look at the purposes of office and what you are enjoying there and you don't want to leave the office you most often do what do, do the bidding of your appoint uh, appointor so that's just the problem but if those uh, offices are separated maybe it will go a long way at least on the professional side you know, the professionalism itself is the main issue. I don't want to say that. You see the uh, improglo and the uh, problem that the MBA have been having with the current Attorney General of the Federation. It has to do with the issue of professionalism and the political aspect of it. There are also provisions for diaspora voting and independent candidacy. If those provisions scale through, do you think that INEC is capable and ready to deal with them? I'm not, uh, I, I don't think so. I'm not too sure. Uh, you know, the, 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 even look at the issue of electronic voting. It's generating a lot of controversy. And we're not yet there. We don't even know what INEC is even doing. I have not, I, 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 we have not even been tested. I mean, there should be a test form on what to be done if you want to go electronic. As of now, we don't know about electronic voting. We don't know how it's going to be done. You get to the polling booth, and you start putting your finger, and you cannot get, you cannot, you cannot uh, be voted. You cannot get things done. So, so I, I think that whatever we want to do, there's still more orientation to be done for all as Nigerians for us to know where we are going. It's, it's good to say it. Uh, those who have been doing it, if you do election in maybe UK and America, you don't even know they are doing election. People go in and come out easily. But look at our situation here. You see policemen all over the place. Look at just ordinary uh, primary election, the shootings and all that. The, 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 the way people are even barraging the uh, press and everything with so many falsehood. And you know it is false just because they want to get to that position. So INEC definitely is doing a lot of work. They are trying, but we are not yet there. So let's even do the one internal and master it and get it done before you can even talk of diaspora. That's my own position. Welcome back. The meeting of Southwest Attorneys General has ended in Oshun State with some key recommendations. The AGs agreed on a legal framework in their states. They also agreed to convene a meeting with Amotecon commanders on interstate cooperation, sustaining arrest, and achieving effective prosecution of criminals. They also agreed to ensure harmonization of processes leading to the appointment of judges, just as they reaffirmed their commitment to judicial financial autonomy. The Attorneys General in the southwest region of Nigeria converged in Oshogbo, the Oshun State Capital, for their quarterly meeting to deliberate on issues happening in their various states. Top on their agenda is how to harmonize the laws of southwest states. Some of the chief law officers here share what they have been able to do in their various states in terms of addressing common and peculiar challenges. I'm a tech in all those states now investigates all cases and they have also been given enough uh, support by the Minister of Justice to prosecute some of these cases. Because we noticed that um, the police, when they prosecute criminal cases, they have a tendency to criminalize what are otherwise contractual disputes. So if you have a fight with your neighbor, maybe he borrowed you 100,000 naira. The police and you are you maybe due to economic reasons or even deliberately you can't repay. The police will charge you for obtaining under false pretenses. You can't pay your rent. They charge you to court. So we established what we call district prosecutors, and we station them in all the magistrate courts. Their job or their duty essentially is to vet all charges drafted by. IPOs. To achieve better socio-economic development, necessary laws have to be in place. And without a strong handshake among the attorneys general across the southwest state, improving the prosecutorial and administration of criminal justice system may be Herculean. 
interboundary crimes, we are addressing it in, in, in setting up interstate uh, joint task force. You will have read recently that Ogu State and Oyo State, when they were kidnapping and all that, sent up, we have established joint you know, patrol task force that will be patrolling our intervention because somebody can commit uh, offense uh, in Ogun and run into our forest in Oyo. The same, so we need to have a joint patrol. The purpose of this meeting essentially is to um, talk to each other and agree on how to fast track the harmonization of the laws of Southwest states. That is on the agenda. We're also looking at the students. How do we all harmonize our judgments that are coming uh, from our high courts? Uh, so that again is one agenda that we have placed uh, on, our, on our table. So in all, it's about how to achieve you know, um, speedy um, integration. At the end of today, we would have agreed on milestones um, to take forward. And hopefully, um, this meeting will, be, will begin this process of ensuring that um, our laws, our jurisprudence, um, they work in tandem across the Southwest states. In other news, the Chief Judge of Lagos has pardoned 33 inmates and granted them freedom. The inmates were drawn from Ikoyi, Kirikiri Medium and Kirikiri Maximum Correctional Centers. We have the report up next. Pursuant to Section 1, Subsection 1 of the Criminal Justice Release from Custody Special Provision Act, which grants the Chief Judge Pass to pardon inmates, Justice Kazim Aluba convened an open court session on the grounds of the Samuel Ilori Courthouse in the Ogba area of Lagos. The CJ is sitting with the Administrative Judge of the Ikeja Division of the Court, Justice Uluato Ipae, other judges who are members of the Decongestion Committee, led by Justice Adenike Koka, and some other magistrates. Some other officials of the Lagos Judiciary are also present here, as well as lawyers representing some of the inmates, the leadership of the correctional centers, and members of non-governmental organizations involved in reform of inmates. Inmates drawn from three correctional centers in Lagos are also here having been processed and assessed by the Decongestion Committee of the Lagos Judiciary. The state's controller of the correctional center, Francis Adebisi, is happy about the exercise. He noted that the population in the custodial centers have become a great challenge due to congestion. You will all agree with me that security has been a great challenge in this country. And for different reasons, an effective performance of the judiciary system, our custodial centers are invariably decongested, I mean congested. The chief judge lamented the prevalence of crimes in the society, but gave the assurance that the decongestion committee had done a thorough job in scrutinizing those recommended for release. Every person who will be afforded the opportunity of being released today has been found fit and qualified and have satisfied all the criteria of the law before they have been put forward today to be so released. All those who will be released, as we soon tell them, to see it as a real opportunity to retrace their steps and not come into conflict with the law again, as otherwise this kind of privilege may not come their way. A total of 33 inmates were released in all, with the CJ urging those released to be of good behavior as harder punishments will be meted out on any of the inmates caught committing a crime again. Some of the non-governmental organizations immediately pledged cash and other support materials to the released inmates to make it easier for them to be integrated back into the society. And as part of his aim to engender diversity and inclusion in the affairs of the Nigerian Bar Association, the president of the bar has inaugurated a Lawyers with Disabilities Forum. We have more details in this next report. Uh, uh, people only take us. This is the first of its kind in the history of the association and gathered here to witness this history is the leadership of the bar and the leadership of the Association of Lawyers with Disabilities. The occasion is the inauguration of a Lawyers with Disabilities Forum of the Nigerian Bar Association. The president of the bar, Ulumidi Akwata, said that he identified with the fact that many lawyers with disability had long felt alienated in their struggle. And this is why the forum had now been put in place to champion their cause. If at the level of the MBA we are able to set up support and sustain our LWDF, then we can begin to preach to the rest of society. We must ensure that in the conferences that we have, 
three of them for each of the sections, and then at the annual general conference, we will sensitize our members and let them understand that just as the Women's Forum and the, and the Young Lawyers Forum is here, are here to stay, the LWDF is here to stay. And these are the requirements. This is what we need to ensure that our members really feel that they are part of the association and we are not just paying lip service to, to the fact that they are members. The creation of the forum is a giant stride for its members to advance their legal practice in a less difficult, productive and fulfilling manner, a cardinal point of the campaign promise of the current leadership of the bar. The president announces the inauguration of a 10-member committee as initial members of the governing council of the forum with Mrs. Aisha Ahmed Arufai as the chairperson. Promised on my part to do whatever I can to ensure that within this short period of time that we have, we would do as much as we can to ensure that one, we have uh, enlightened people, our members in particular, about the need to include everybody, especially uh, lawyers with disabilities. Two, we will make sure that we have a record of every member of the MBA that has a disability because that is the easiest way for us to be able to deliver on some of the programs that we intend, you know, so that uh, we all feel useful and uh, contribute to the betterment of the MBA at large. The immediate task ahead of the committee is to educate, sensitize and bridge the gap in practice amongst lawyers with disabilities and their other colleagues. And just before we go, here's a recap of some of the legal stories in the news. We begin with the reports that the Federal High Court sitting in Abuja has ordered the interim forfeiture of a property reasonably suspected to be proceeds of unlawful activities of former Imo State Governor Senator Rocha Sokrocha. Justice Emeka Mwite gave the order while ruling on a motion ex parte brought by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission seeking the forfeiture of the property on the grounds that it was acquired illegally. Before adjourning to the 13th of April, the court also directed that the interim forfeiture order be published in the National Dailies, alerting anyone with interest in the property to show cause why it should not be permanently forfeited to the federal government of Nigeria. In a related development, another judge of the same court has fixed March the 28th for the EFCC to serve court papers on the former governor ahead of his planned arraignment for an alleged 2.9 billion Ara fraud. Justice Inyang Ekwo fixed the date after the EFCC told his court that affecting service of court documents on the Koracha had been difficult because of the retinue of security operatives around the senator. The same Justice Inyang Ekwo has ordered the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency to respond within 48 hours to a bill request filed by Abba Kiari, a suspended Deputy Commissioner of Police who is in custody for his alleged involvement in a 25-kilogram cocaine deal. Kiari, who instituted the lawsuit to regain his freedom after he was handed over to the NDLEA by the police in Abuja, is seeking to be released on health grounds. Among other things, Abba Kiari is challenging his continued detention by the NDLEA. He is also asking the court to order the federal government to pay him 500 million naira as well as tender a written apology to him in two national dailies for the unlawful violation of his fundamental human rights. Still in Abuja, another judge of the same federal high court, Justice Ubiora Iguatu, has ordered the interim forfeiture of about 10 properties and funds in banks allegedly owned by former Zamfara State Governor Abdulaziz Yari. Justice Iguatu gave the order while ruling on an ex parte application made by the Independent Corrupt Practices and Other Related Offences Commission. Some of the properties, according to the ICPC, are in Maryland, USA, Abuja, Kaduna, among others. The judge said the interim order will last for 60 days to enable the ICPC to conclude its investigation, following which the commission could apply for final forfeiture. In Jos, the Federal High Court has sentenced former Minister of Water Resources Sarah Ochekwe and two others to three years' imprisonment each for money laundering and conspiracy. The Economic and Financial Crimes Commission secured the conviction in a judgment delivered by Justice Haruna Kuria, who found the trio of Sarah Ochekwe, Raymond Dabo and Leo Sande Jiton guilty on two of the three count charges made against them. The court, however, gave the convicts the option of paying a million naira fine on each of the count. The trio promptly paid the fine and have since been released. And we round off with a report that the Lagos High Court in Ikeja has sentenced kidnapped kingpin Chuku Dumeme Oamadike, popularly known as Evans, to life imprisonment. Justice Hakim Oshodi convicted and sentenced him alongside two others, Uche Naamadi and Okuchuku Mwachuku. 
The judge handed out the sentence to the trio after convicting them on a two-count charge of conspiracy and kidnapping of a businessman, Donatus Dunu. In convicting the trio, Justice Oshodi held that the prosecution had successfully proved the charge against them beyond reasonable doubt. That's the program this week. Thank you for watching. Please catch up with past episodes on our YouTube page. I am Shola Sheeli. See you next week.